and walking on a, a beautiful estate in the, the highlands. And I'll leave, leave a link on the show page today because there's a bit of history to this, this place that I shall not try and do for you now. I'll make a, a proper pig's ear of it, as my grandmother used to say. But uh, before I introduce what we're doing on today's show, let me make a sketchbook image. Now, I could do wonderful vistas of uh, these grounds and the glens I, I'm treading this week. But uh, no, let me do something I've been working on this afternoon, which is making photographs of small pools of light, small pools of of, um, of interest, really. Uh, sometimes it's a bit of vegetation. Other times, a bit of running water, perhaps. Here's one, right by a tree. The tree is shading the, the ground all around it, apart from one small, very small section. So when I make pictures like this, it's usually a stop or two under, 125th, oh, three stops under. 3.6, F3.6, 320 ISO. Let's get a focal point and there we go. There's a, a sketchbook or sketchbook picture <laughs> to start this week's show. Now, my father would have been 93 on Wednesday. The date marks almost three decades since his passing. I actually had to run that by a few times in my mind because it, it really, really, really doesn't seem that long ago but it is with um with a huge amount of respect and reverence for my dear mum i would say that my dad was without a doubt my my greatest teacher my mentor the person who said you can do this i'm uh, i'm lucky to have had three you can do this people in my life of course, um, I know that our teachers, our mentors, come in all forms. They're not necessarily close family members. Not always mothers, not always fathers, and grandparents, so on. But I do have three in my life that I'd like to, to share, one of whom is the, the focus of today's show in a, in a more photographic sense, that is. So uh, let me start with Dad and set the scene for today's photo walk show. Now, I always wanted to work on the wireless, as we called it, once upon a time, the radio. Since the age of, um, I think about 12, possibly, possibly a little later, but a long, long time ago. I announced the fact I'd like to do this, and far from recoil with the horror that I think some... Uh, some parents, some guardians might. My dad picked it up and ran with it straight away. He embraced the whole thing. Uh, he had absolutely no idea what it took to work as a radio presenter, but uh, he believed wholly that um, this could happen. But fast, I'm going to fast forward and rewind quite a lot over the next minute or two, so bear with me. Uh, before I got the job at the, at the BBC in London, my big break, we'd, uh, we've been... Uh, as a new presenter lineup, absolutely sworn to secrecy. We weren't allowed to say what was happening on this particular radio station and the lineup that was coming up. Uh, but of course, that didn't apply to Dad. I told, <laughs> I told him immediately, and uh, he sprang into action with um, with a series of driving lessons. I could drive already by then, but uh, he. Uh, <laughs> He took me by car from the Shires uh, into the city of London for about, I don't know, two, two months, three months. And the, the purpose of the whole thing was, these, these um, driving lessons, was to uh, learn every single back double in case of a traffic problem as I was driving in to do my, my programmes. And he did this, as I say, for two, possibly three months at 1 a.m. in the morning, the time I'd be driving in for my show. And then often, he'd return home and he'd start a day's work himself. Now, I said there were three. A man called Robbie was uh, one of the others who were uh, rewinding, rewind now, back through to my, my teens when I was learning my craft on voluntary hospital radio stations. He also had the, the belief to allow me to take to the airwaves prior to the rules that said you had to be in your later teens. Um, I mentioned him, actually, in a previous show. I'll leave a link for it. And then there was, and still is, a third. You know him. 
because I've mentioned him before many times. I'd like to think he's one of the central characters, actually, of this show, uh, along with many of those, and you know who you are, who've written in and contributed across the, the past few years. Uh, the contribution this man has made to my photographic life, though, has been the fuel that have kept the wheels turning. Even at the times I've questioned my skill levels or abilities in photography, because none of us are, it seems, immune to imposter syndrome. And his name is Giles Penfound. So the first two names were to do with radio, and Giles is to do with this thing, photography. And I suppose, by extension, radio, podcasting, stroke radio, broadcasting, similar kind of melting pot. Now, Giles is a former army photographer. He's a, he's a documentary photographer. I met right at the start of my photographic career two decades ago, and I had no idea just how important Giles would be to my, my confidence and self-belief. He, like my father had, showed for <laughs> some reason a level of belief which was probably, if I were to be entirely honest with you, completely at odds with my real abilities at the time. Never mind now, but uh, the title today is um, Our Greatest Teachers. Though really it's dedicated to the thoughts of one man, and that's my dear friend and mentor, teacher and confidant in photography, Giles Penfound, who, as I say, for some reason, believed in me enough that I could carry forward a scintilla of his belief, enough to provide a spark for my career uh, behind a lens. It's another special this week. We've got a few in a row while I'm still away in Scotland. It's the final week of our Scottish photo retreat. Uh, that, by the way, will be our show next week. And I promise you a lot, a lot of learnings and laughs and um, any other word that starts with L for the alliteration police. But this special features some choice recordings from the archive with my friend Giles. Some stretch a while back. Um, and some are far more recent. But in that you always hear new thoughts within a recording, I think, every single time you listen back, I reckon this works OK. So today then, you, me, and my good friend Giles walking the paths, something I'd like to do far more with guests. Uh, Zoom is great and has opened up a world of opportunity and interviews and guests, but nothing beats walking with a friend and recording your chat and your thoughts as you walk. It is, after all, the photo walk. I do have um, an addendum to this intro, which I'll save for a moment, which is important, and I'll, I'll share that in, in just a tick. Today on The Photo Walk... That's what it's about. It's about the people, you know, the... I think, I, And that's why I love being a documentary photographer. Well... Look, I call myself a documentary photographer because it's it's the two words which most readily describe what I do. 90% of what I do is not making pictures. 90% of what I do is, a, is about finding out the story. Welcome along as we make our photo walks together, a show where we walk and make pictures, photographically sketchbooking our time together each week, listening back to special conversations with guests from around the world. And it's all made possible by our Patreon members, who I call Extra Milers, and of course, MPB. I am a very happy user, personally, of MPB. They've been supporting us now since pretty much the start of the show. And of course, I'm really grateful for that, and grateful for the support that you give MPB as well, with your trust. The largest global platform to buy, sell and trade in used photo and video gear, that's MPB committed to making gear more accessible and more affordable, recirculating 570,000 cameras and lenses a year, extending the life and creative potential of visual storytelling gear. There's another thing that I think is really important, and I'll say this for a couple of weeks, that's customer service. An MPB are known for their first-class customer service. You can receive support through their help centre or you can speak to an expert over the phone or via live chat. Hang about, Neil. Did you say speak to a person? Yes, I did. A real person? Yes, I did. Yeah, an actual person that knows stuff about cameras. And yes, I did. I did, I did, I did. MPB is not a marketplace. They buy directly from visual storytellers and evaluate all items before reselling MPB approved kit. 
Put simply, they are the largest global platform to buy, sell and trade used photo and video kit. A simple, safe and circular way to trade, upgrade and get paid for kit. Buy, sell, trade, create. Go to mpb.com forward slash change. Two weeks of best of specials while I'm in Scotland, walking the glens with our wonderful photo walkers. Though advance notice for Friday 27th, it'll be the Scottish Retreat Edition, where you get to hear what we got up to, a flavour of Scotland, on the 27th. Right, let's start this week's edition. Shall we walk? Checklist out. Coffee. Check. Garibaldi's. Check. Walking boots. Check. SD cards or a spare roll of film. Check. Well, let's walk. We, uh, we do, by the way, have the assignment for the month. So uh, keep sending those in. The word for the month uh, will, um, will come up in a short while. So I, I will remember to do that on today's photo walk. But before I start walking with Giles and a camera, I, I'd like to add something about our, our greatest teachers. I thought about my dad, actually, to start with. Now, my, my father, my dad, passed on before I'd lifted a camera professionally, although he did unwittingly or unknowingly kickstart my photography interests twice. Once when he bought me an old Zenit camera, might have been a new one actually, I say old <laughs> because they are, but it was a Zenit camera in my early teens. And then again, when he bought me a gift the first Christmas, I was at the BBC. He bought me a Nikon, 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 wherever you are in the world, a pronunciation guide, a Nikon film camera. More, it was a more a sort of a compact Nikon camera. It wasn't an SLR. And there was a card that accompanied the gift, and on that card were the words, well, something along the lines of, I can't remember entirely, but they were along the lines of, something to remember what you do. You see so much more of the world and meet so many interesting, famous people. Make sure you take pictures of them. Now, to my shame, I didn't use that camera as much as I should or could. And uh, I, I always wonder if I was slightly embarrassed, actually, to ask for portraits. I did take a few, and there are some precious frames that came out of that camera, which I still have. I should pop another roll in and start using the camera, actually. But I didn't use it in the way that um, I think my, I know my father had uh, intended. Uh, I, th I think an early 20s lad was a bit embarrassed to say, excuse me, Mr. Joel, name drop clang, could I take a picture of you? Dad and Giles, doing the maths now, they never met, but um, if they did or had have done, I reckon they would have thoroughly enjoyed each other's company. There's a lot of similarities between them that I see and uh, that I also actually hear. Probably never said that to you, Giles, and I hope I'm not embarrassing you too much at this point. If you're listening, that is. In terms of um, mentors and teachers, though, Dad and Giles and the shows about Giles, they are the most, with Robbie, important teachers that I had. And that's what today's show is about. And in terms of mentors and teachers, I've got a very important question for you, actually, which I'll ask at the, the tail end of today's show. Oh, Neil, you tease. Right. Today's show then, whilst I'm away walking in Scotland on the retreat, is an archive special and it features the musings as we walk of a very precious teacher in my life. Hopefully it'll all make sense as it joins together because they, they are a bit disjointed, these conversations. They were recorded uh, several years or several months apart in places. I, I think they'll make sense. Here is my special friend, my teacher, Giles Penfound. We should have had this conversation uh, this time last week. It's a Monday. Not that you'd know that listening at the moment, but as I'm recording, it's a Monday. And we went to see Chris Killip last week, the late Chris Killip, his exhibition. Um, known as, I think he's known as the Manx photographer, wasn't he, really? That's, that's what he became known as. This uh, extraordinary 
um, work that he did back on his um, his home island. But he, he actually gave up a career, didn't he? And he was doing really, he was flying really high. A very much respected studio assistant and photographer in his own right. And he just decided to go back to to the Isle of Man, which is, which was quite a brave decision, wasn't it? But why why do you think he went? No, per- perhaps it's perhaps it's got something to do with pursuing the thing that that makes the most interest or is of the most interest to you. You know, um, I mean, it was interesting looking at the the sort of stories that he was shooting and the sort of ideas that he was following, and also the amount of time that he was taking. Um, to to pursue those individual stories, and there must have there there must have been something that for more than just transcended this idea of I've got to make a story, and well and that, that's the that's the hook you know that's the the big imponderable isn't it of, of why and it got us talking about audiences because the last five six seven years or so you you've been going through a, a situation where you've been wondering what project. To, uh, to make your own and it's become like him there are so many similarities between the two of you in, in that he has decided that his home is where his project is and I wonder when you found that because it's been a few years in the making this isn't it? Well yeah it has it's been let me think I, I, I probably did the first story about 24 years ago <laughs> not knowing that it was going to turn, in, turn into this um, and it, I just did it because this was a, a, a story called Rosie, but an old lady we used to look after. Um, and that's sort of sparked off into a couple of other stories as well. And uh, this idea of hometown stories sort of crept in and, and this title crept in and it, it dropped for a long, long while. And then about, I don't know, last 10 years have been... One could say sort of interesting. <laughs> well, you've had you've had various different projects, including yeah. at one stage refusing to go anywhere near humans with a camera. <laughs> you slowed it right down as well, didn't you? I slowed it down to such a degree <laughs> that I've, I've been, of torpitude, if that's if there's yeah. such a such a word. Anyway, and and it was a journey. God, yeah, <laughs> that's that horrible thing. No, it. What I've realised now is, and why the Chris Killip exhibition was so pertinent to, to me not that I, it's not about comparing or anything like that it's just it's just what, what one gets from these things is I went for the longest stage of searching for being desperate to find you know this this kind of almost I don't know rabid thing of I've, I haven't got a project I've got to search for a project yeah. and so the harder you look you know, the more desperate you look, the less you're able to see what's what's immediately in front of your face. I mean, there was searching for Albion, actually, wasn't there? Is yeah. that is that project now gone or? Yeah, well, it, it, it's it's pointless. It, yeah. it, you know, uh, it's, what was searching for Albion? Well, it was hometown stories, but with for Great Britain. Right. You know, and and um, again, it, it was too grand. It was too big. It was too. Um, you know, what should I do? You know, yeah. the grand master type of nonsense. Um, and through some personal kind of instances of the last year or so, for real, real breakthroughs, I just realised, and again, this is only my own personal idea. It's got no, no I'm not pushing my ideas on anybody at all. But all of a sudden I realised is that, you know, I'm, I've just been foolish because what, what was here... Right, see, I mean, we you know, we, today we're working on Green and Common. I've been photographing here for 23 years, and I haven't exhausted, uh, you know, I haven't scratched the surface of this place. Well, I found new places just the weekend <laughs> gone that I didn't, I didn't know existed here. Well, again, you take, this, you take this as an example, and you look at this area, and, you know, at the moment we're walking, and we can see open heathland, yeah. and there's, okay, there's these old military bunkers there, da 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 which are quite exciting. But on the face of it, you can... Oh, there's not much here, is there? But it's there is. It flatters the fens part of it. Yeah, and and but it's it's only when I think you perhaps stop looking. I don't know. I, I, it, this it sounds perhaps too too trite, but when you stop looking and stop get away from that desperation, that you really start seeing, and not only start seeing, but start understanding what you're seeing and and have some sort of affinity for what you're seeing, and then it's a case of oh, all right, yeah. <laughs> you know. I think Chris Killip, by what what we saw, what we read, 
uh, the information that was available at the exhibition about him probably went through a similar a similar or along a similar path um, making that decision to return home because he felt he knew he knew there was a photographic project a story in him in his uh, his own hometown I suppose that's a lot like Edison's light bulb we're having our Edison's light bulbs aren't we you know how many how many times it was it 10,000 1,000 however many times it was it took it took a fair amount to switch on switch off before it worked yeah no absolutely and and it's and again this comes down to the the whole purpose and reason and why this is being done because look you know I'm you know take my own ego aside I'm, I'm no one of any consequence okay and I say that I say that with real humility and 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 honesty is so I'm not doing this because I want people to go, oh, look how wonderful Giles thinks he is, or da da da, or whatever. Look, you know, for the fame, fortune, and the click, you know, the clicks. And it, absolutely, it's not. It's not about that. It's once you have found the why. Why well, found the why? I, I can't explain that why to anybody, but I know I know the the value of it. So therefore, when I'm going through and doing this work as I'm as I'm doing now, it's 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 kind of comfortable. It's I don't have to question it anymore. Yeah. What is what is the what is the purpose? What is the purpose of what we do? And I, and and all too often in photography, there's this grand plan is assumed. This this massive importance is assumed. It's a perfect example of this. Let me bring up my phone because I got I, I, last night when I was looking at um, one of my favourite things on TV on the BBC. At the end of it. Um, you know they have the what's also so on. You can you, know, you oh, can right, you can okay. have other things that are also yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And there was a, it was just a picture of of a uh, um, two young people on the beach, obviously taken a long time ago. And I went, oh, that looks rather interesting. Clicked on it. And it was about a lady called Mary Ellis Young, um, who is a, a Northern Irish photographer, so a Protestant Northern Irish photographer at the turn of the last century. Right. So, you know, I, think, I suppose 1910, 1915, wow. round about there. And she was part, you know, part of a fairly well-to-do family, but, you know, of that generation, of that age, where, you know, women, you know, seen and not heard and all that sort of appalling nonsense, and women weren't really photographers or weren't really allowed to be yada yada and all that, that rubbish. But she made the most exquisitely beautiful pictures about her family, the people that she was interacting mm. with, her estate, the estate where she lived, the you know the ordinary people, the everyday people, her her, her hometown stories, and and now those pictures in these beautiful on these shot on beautiful glass plate. Mm. Um, there's a big exhibition in Northern Ireland about it. <laughs> she and would it, never have known. No, 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 she wouldn't have known. Because she wasn't making it for that reason. Fast forward 40 years, and, and then, of course, uh, Vivian Meyer comes to mind immediately, who equally did not know, I assume she didn't know, that all this fuss was going to happen. She didn't, uh, surely, she, she didn't perceive that there, there would be this clamour for her work in the way that there has been. No, I don't, I don't think she had an idea. Yeah. I, I, I didn't, but that was her hometown story yeah, well, with her charges. Well, exactly. and yeah. I, don't, I don't think anybody has got any sort of clue yeah. what she thought or, or or her reasons or her rationale or, or what we can, we can surmise in, in, in both people with, with, with Mary Alice Young and Vivian Meyer and, oh, and a host of other people yeah, yeah. That, that just make images or make stories or record this, this extraordinary world in which we live in just for the sake of it and uh, something like, was it you asked me you know, who's it for why are we doing it well it's it's for us you know if if you know the, the first the first view of the first uh, participant in the work we do is us the people who make it you know because we can't be divorced from that mm. well, I don't I don't think we, we have to or can be you know it's, it's why am I making this because I'm I'm interested you know I, I did um I'm doing a story at the moment uh, about a theatre group in Newbury. It's a, sort of a, a um, it's a group called the New Era, New Era Players, right? And um, they've been going for forty years, and what? it's a real amateur, amateur group. Yeah, yeah. And I only found out about them because you know, Nicola and I, my wife, we went to go and see a play, and it was just brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you stumble across these people who I've been living next, literally next to, for the last seventeen years. I had no idea they were. Anyway, so I've been going along and making some images and, and just discovering, just finding out. You know, for me, the most exciting thing is is, is the people. You know, the, the uh, lady I was photographing, particularly on Saturday, uh, Jane, 
Um, when I first went there, people said, oh, you know, she's a scene producer and she makes all the scenes, but you know, she, she, she doesn't like to be photographed. She, you know, uh, there's all this idea that she doesn't, you know, she was very difficult. Absolutely not. It's just the, the most delightful person. Because it's that, initially, there's that interaction between me, one human being, and another human being, i.e. her. And that, that dialogue and that, that yeah. lovely dance yeah. between the, you know, the three of us, i.e. the two of us and the camera, and the ideas that I have. And... And so I've got some beautiful images of her. Now, you know, they're not going to be in the National Portrait Gallery. No, no one in but, London... Although, who knows? Well, you know, but... But, but, <laughs> but who, that's not why you're doing no, it. No, but who cares? Yeah. I mean, genuinely, I'm not just saying it, you know, as some sort of false modesty. Um, what's that lovely thing you say? Humble bragging. Humble bragging. I, I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of, you know, I don't want your, your listeners to go, oh, Charles is so wise and, you know... <laughs> Wise of knowledge, <laughs> it's not. It's just not that. It's not. I. I in, if if that, if that's our only concern as photographers and, and me as a documentary photographer is, is you know, uh, um, how many likes I'm going to get, I'm gonna give up. Because yeah. yeah, then you're not you're not looking at what what the subject is doing, what the subject is saying, and, and who are they. Are. And and that's just uh, it's just brilliant. So never mind. There's gold in them. Their hills. There's gold in them. Their steps outside our door. Yeah. the last 10 years, you've been in and out in terms of whether an audience is important. You didn't want anybody to see your work. You were, you were printing it for yourself and yourself only. But I think audiences have become a, a, a slightly more important to you. And there's nothing to be ashamed in wanting to find an audience. And, and for a lot of photographers, that's a, that's, you know, that's a tricky thing to admit, isn't it? Because we feel, well, not all of us, but we... Many of us feel a bit embarrassed about saying, yeah, I'd like it to be liked. I'm not talking about the capital L on Instagram, but I'm talking about people seeing it and appreciating it. Perhaps there's an honesty, and, and, and uh, it's, it's something that I've always kind of, in my work and kind of life, is bang on about, is the honesty of what one does. Perhaps that's the honesty of recognising what all these different elements are. And, and audience is such a huge element, it really is. And... Uh, and also being honest enough to to say to yourself, well, yeah, it is. It's quite a nice for people to like what you do. Yeah, you know, there's surely as as you know, creative types and uh, and artistic types and photographers. There's there's part of that our ego and and the good part. Then we go, well, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice to be liked. It's nice to, you know, people to acknowledge what we're doing and and what I'm doing and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, to a to a point. Um, beyond that point, it becomes too, I don't know, self-serving and too all about me. But I think just recognising that, that, yeah, that's okay. What I'm also very comfortable with and honest with is, it is there's absolutely no point in me making this work if it doesn't get seen. Mm. Okay, if people don't engage with it. Um, if Does it have to be lots of people? Because that's the conversation, isn't it? That you know, it's. It, I speak to photographers that become very disenchanted, uh, demoralised by making a picture that only goes on to have so many likes. Um, and okay, that could be a social media disease. Is it important to you? Quantity, you mean? No, yeah. no, I don't give a damn. I really don't. It's. it's <sighs> Yeah, you know, the, the amount of people and who those people and the reactions that those people give, it, it's not within my control. No. And perhaps that's one of the joys of it. You, we put this work out into the world and it assumes a life is of its own. It, it assumes a, I don't know, a, an audience of its own. And people will react to it or not, depending on a lot of factors that have got n thankfully nothing to do with me yeah. and I've just got to accept that you know I can't I can't demand that um, you know that people view this or like it or whatever because it's it's just nonsense so I think we, if we for me I have an ease with it now and I have a and also it's just a I don't know, 
being a bit more grown up about it, um, being a bit more adult about it. Yeah. To say, listen, I okay, I've got you know the vast number of two hundred people following me on social media. Okay, that's just it. It means nothing other than the people who, who engage with it and. The people who engage with it, I'm lucky if 30 people engage with work, work yeah. that I put, which is fine. It's just absolutely fine. Um, you know, am I going to feel really any more different if 30 people engage with it or 30,000? You know, when does the figure end? You know, when, when is enough is in, enough is enough? I think the purity of it is the, the most important people for me who have an engagement with it are the subjects. Yeah because I always give them prints and show them the work. That's, yeah. that's the most important thing. After that, well, it's, it's not up to me. And, and if, I, if I detach myself from that, that sort of, um, I don't know, mania of, of needing uh, um, uh, you know, uh, justification and, and verification. Validation. Or, or validation. Yeah. There we go, that's the one. Then I'm, I'm missing the whole point of it. You know, because then it's not about the story, then it's not about the subject. It's just about, you know, my ego. It's very interesting to talk to somebody who has got what you might term as a modest Instagram account, who's, who started out afresh, because you've, you've gone, you've come back, you've gone, you've come back, <laughs> you've, you've gone, you've come back. You've made several journeys like that over the last decade <laughs> within social media. But the interesting thing for me is to talk to somebody who's got a modest... Um, uh, or a slight <laughs> I don't know yeah, cool. slight I feel like I'm insulting you now but at the moment it is yeah. in terms of um, I, I think the metrics that, that people place as important within their social media circles or in terms of you know, how, how many numbers they've got when I look at a photograph a couple of weeks ago that uh, was posted for various reasons a picture that came back after well many many years after you made it the famous picture of Colonel Tim Collins on the eve of the Iraq war making his infamous speech pointing in the air and pointing at the troops you made that picture yeah. nobody else made that picture it's a very famous picture you made it it's been seen hundreds of thousands millions time of times probably and it's been featured in newspapers it's been a still within television uh, news reports which is interesting to then understand from the perspective of somebody who's starting out afresh almost yeah, I, I, I know you're very proud of that picture. No, I am. I, I, I you know, it, it just, I'm always kind of, there's that sort of, sort of free song of excitement every time it gets published. And it was published a couple of weeks ago again in the Times, big sort of double page spread. And, yeah. You know, and again, that's where, you know, recognizing that, being honest and saying, do you know what? Yeah, it, it, it gave me a bit of a thrill. There's a bit of an ego boost. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but you go past it, you're going to go, okay, so what? So I'm going, to, I'm going to live the rest of my life on one, maybe two, maybe three pictures that keep on, keep on cropping up. Yeah, well, that may be good for other people, that's not good for me. What I'm, what I'm much more interested in is, okay, so it's a, I'll try and be brief with this, but so a few, well, before Christmas, um, just in the road where I live, they were resurfacing the road. And I just cycled back from doing another project, um, and uh, as I sort of cycled past these roadworks, these guys doing the roadworks, there's a guy in front of a big lorry, and he was on a contraption that looked like something from the Teletubbies. I don't know if anybody <laughs> remembers the Nunu, which was the Hoover that did tubby custard or whatever. <laughs> which is I do not know. You've got to have a look at it. It's fantastic. Our kids weren't really... We kept them away from that show. It, 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 it felt something quite... The evil undertones, overtones oh, about... Away with it. What, it the lovely. Teletubbies? Yeah, it was it was, it, it was odd. Mind you, it was, no, it was no odder than the Ninky Nonk on, <laughs> on In the Night Garden. But anyway, that's not what we're discussing. <laughs> so anyway... Yes. Yeah. So you got me started now. It was just this, it was just this lovely, I don't know, shape... Right. Um, this right. lovely, weird-looking thing. So I sort of chucked the bike down, got my camera out, and I went around the front of the scene. It was moving dead slow because they were doing something to the, the white lines or whatever in the middle of the road. And uh, I motioned to the, to the chap who was, um, who was driving this thing. Yeah. As to see, you know, point to the camera, thumbs up to take a picture, and he kind of gave me a wave. Anyway, I took the picture, took a series of images, gave him my card, 
and said to him, get in touch, I'll give you a print. Mm. That afternoon, he sent me an email, da 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 made a print for him, sent it off. Two weeks later came the absolute perfect example of why I'm doing this. And it's not about fame or glory or whatever, it's about <laughs> a connection with one person. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, yeah. is that his wife, and I've lost the email, I wish I could find oh. it. But his wife wrote to me and she said, thank you so much for the print you sent. I just want to thank you hugely because I showed it to the uh, to our boys and um, they now know, they now understand what their dad does for a job. <laughs> and it wasn't, that wasn't about me. No. That was about those two boys yeah, yeah. knowing what their dad does yeah. for a living. You know, and, and that picture hopefully will go on in the family history and that thankfully they'll never remember me but they'll remember what dad did what granddad did yeah etc 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 and that's the point mm. you know there's the that's the ultimate audience well, absolutely. of one or two or three yeah no absolutely because <laughs> it's it's a you know it's a genuine thing there's no money exchanged hands you know that's that's important for me doesn't necessarily mean that's important for everybody else but it's 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 just a nice thing yeah you know it's just a nice yeah thing to be able to go well i was able to give somebody a um a picture well a i was able to make a picture which did something for me and it's on my in my studio and then that picture did something for these two boys yeah, that did, yeah. oh that's my dad yeah and that's not bad is it no that's not bad at all what um what became of rosie oh she's <laughs> just great she was just um just one of those because this is many, many years ago, so yeah. I, I don't know whether Rosie is with us anymore. No, no, she well, she was 94 at oh, the time. right. Okay. So this is, what, 20, 24 years yeah. ago? Yeah. And, um, no, was it 24? 20. Yeah, 20 years ago, there we go. And, um, yeah, she was 94 at the time. Just this wonderful, delightful old lady uh, who, you know, um, I think one of the, the only other two women after my wife that I've really fallen in love with not in that way, but yeah. just you know, just a, yeah. just one human being to another, and, yeah. and you know, we, I knew her through my parents-in-law, and um, and then we found out we had a connection because she'd, she'd served in the army in oh, the, in the Second World right. War, yeah. but we'd say so both served in Hyderabad barracks in Colchester, oh. separated by about forty years. Isn't that funny? And so we had this great connection. Yeah. And um, in fact, the last the last picture of well, last two pictures in the in the in the book in the magazine. Oh, of her looking at a clock and it's kind of a bit sort of um, artistic is it prosaic is that the right word because she we were speaking and the last talk we had was that she was tired she'd had enough oh. she was ready she was ready to die yeah. you know, with no regrets yeah. you know and and the um, the personal privilege of being able to do that of being able to be part of somebody's life you know yeah. with this this thing we do with this with this camera to be to be able to listen to them to be able to I don't know, find out, be a bit nosy as well. I mean, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, just a bit, oh, that's quite interesting. And, you know, because she had some, I think she had some interesting affairs with the, the major she used to drive with, which she, she was quite cheeky, actually, she really was. <laughs> but, you know, then, then she died and she moved on. So, yeah. but then that story now, because of that story, not because of me, but because of that story, other people know about Rosie. Yes. And so now... See, now Hometown Stories is, is almost, and I say this with, with massive humility, it's starting to, to gain a life of its own because people who I'm photographing are talking about Hometown Stories yeah. and they're referencing Rosie and they're referencing the story that they read about her and saw about her. And so, I mean, what, what better kind of um, introduction or, or impetus can you have for a story than that? And, and her story will go on. Mm. You know, and be perhaps I don't know. You know people will, will will be affected with it by for a whole range of reasons. You know. Who's the guy in the trees? Who's, who's the guy in the trees here? Well, so I think this is a perfect example of what I love about doing this. And and in fact, so these. The, the centre picture and the picture on there is the same person. That's a guy called Richard Smith. And he is one of the groundkeepers and gardeners up at the Green and Common oh, in, uh, um, yeah. Business Park. So easy to make judgments about people. You see them, he's a big guy, 
and all the rest of it. And what a lovely chat. What an absolutely interesting, you know, uh, he's be, you know, you could say, well, he's just, he's just this, he just does that. Actually, he's not ordinary at all. Um, you know, he's uh, really interesting in terms of his, what the music he's into, but also he breeds ducks. And he breeds these kind of amazing um, you know, Chinese, Chinese ducks and all the rest of it, or whatever it is. Are you essentially interviewing them as you're photographing? No. I think what I've... I think I've always known this, but, but I've, I've sort of been able to quantify it more now, is... In order for me to get a photograph, the photograph that I want, there's a payment that I need to make. And the payment, yes, and the payment for that photograph is engaging with this person and letting them speak. Because I think that's what people want to do. Not only to speak, to, but be heard. And by me, because I never, never research anything when, whenever I do work, absolutely not. So when I come up across anybody, you engage with them on a human level and you just start talking. Because I think if you start photographing first, you know, th there's a potential for you to miss so much, to miss the real story because you're, you're engaged in this, the story that you think that it's about when actually just by being quiet, a bit sort of demure, if, if that's the right word, you let them say something, let them talk, and then all of a sudden something comes out. And then, um, you know, for instance, the way he was standing there, He's standing like that, he's relaxed, relaxed like that, because previously I'd have made that investment and listened to him. So, so previous to this, this is up in the up in Green and Common, and these are mm. things called the balancing ponds, and it's all, they're all overgrown, so they've got the what? balancing ponds. Are these the ponds I come across that are in different colours that I think, what on earth is yes, that? Yeah, I think, I think they're so. often very clay, yes. very sort yeah, of right, uh, yeah. um, light brown colours, yeah. which I, I, I'm always worried that Barney's going to drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and then the whole area is kind of littered with these balancing, the, these ponds. balancing ponds and other, other bits and pieces. They so balance what? Um, I have no idea. Right, okay. I, I just, I'm just a lovey and I don't understand those, <laughs> sort, of technical, those sort of technical details. But, uh, th so the point is, they, they were going there to do some work and I believe if I had, as they were coming down, if I had just dove straight in and started to make pictures. Yes. And we'd only kind of met up, you know, about 15, 20 minutes beforehand. I'm not invested in him, so it's, it, then it's not about him. So it's just about this bloke coming around and taking, taking pictures. So did you uh, diarise to meet this man that's working on the no, land? No, how, how did you meet him in the first place? Then? So Do we just walking? Well, it, it, I, I had met him previously because I'd, I'd walked around and introduced oh, right. myself. Yeah. So they knew they knew who I was. But uh, uh, so one day I was walking up at the up at the common, trying to find them. Literally, I was walking, they drove down in their truck, said, well, what are you doing? I jumped in, well, what are you doing now? We're going to do this. I said, can I come along? Fantastic. And they, they, they brought me along, which is, which is lovely. And then, then that's that idea of, okay, they, they're about to do something which I'm interested in. Right, stop. And so this, this is a process I always like to teach people about, about a wait and see. Spend time, spend time to analyse, spend time to really look and see what they're doing, not what you want them to do. Yeah. Because actually what they're doing, I think, is far more creative than what you, you can make them do. You, you find in your wedding stuff, or any commercial stuff you use, okay, you can pose people up, but actually people together, like a bride and groom together, they're like much more naturally yeah. together than if you, if you, over, you know, overpose them. And also, look, the, just get rid of one of these fallacies that as a documentary photographer, somehow you're... You're, you're floating ethereally through the, you know, through the world and never, never engaging. What a load of absolute nonsense! The fact of you just yeah. being there with a camera changes. You know, it's this Schrodinger's cat thing changes everything. It's, 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 it's. Yeah, it's you know. this, this conversation that we constantly have about: Am I being intrusive? Um, should, you know, I'll step back. My, my job is to. Document the day without you noticing I'm I'm there. Well, I mean, I mean, look at me. I, I don't store away neatly with the upright Hoover. I'm not exactly <laughs> a, a small frame, so it's nonsense, isn't it? And if you look at Don McCullin, six foot whatever he is, um, he's not unobtrusive, non-intrusive. What well, is unobtrusive? So unobtrusive. I'm, I'm using a medical word. Intrusive, intrusive is something rather different. But but he's not either. You know, it's, it's, it, but it's 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 the act of how you are with people, isn't it? Well, that's, that, that's precisely. And I think if you if you if you stop this 
Well, don't get into this ridiculous thing that that you feel that you're an other, that you're not part of the scene, that you're not part of what's what's going on. We, well, you clear you clearly are, and, and to what level you engage with that is mm. depends on your personality and a whole heap of things actually on the ground itself. But just to to be able to see what people do, but also to be ready to anticipate what people do, to be ready for the possibility of things happening. And sometimes it just doesn't work out and you're in the wrong place and you you think, oh, hell, I should have been there or or whatever. Um, But I I think by by being quiet and gentle and kind, not only verbally and emotionally, but in terms of how you move to the environment and the subject, is that you are, I think you get into a state of mind where you recognise what's happening and you, you can see that. And, and we were talking at this time and he, I can't remember what he was explaining. Yeah. But he was you saying... You can talk and take photographs at the same well, time. Absolutely, you? yeah. You know, mm. and, and, you know, the, you know the, uh, this idea that, that, you know, photography is all about using a camera. It's not. I think for, the actual making the photograph for me is probably about 2% of what I do. Would you say the camera's at your side for most of this engagement? It will be, won't it? Well, they... they, they I carry three cameras. There. No, <laughs> what really... I meant was they're down by your side. They're not. Li- they're not even lifted. No, well, they'll be. They'll be in my hand. Mm. So, so depending on, and that was that's on a fifty mil. So I was, I was, you know, about twenty feet away from him at, at the time. So, um, but but they they're there with me. So I'll I'll have it to hand. So yeah. when I'm working, I'll have, have one to hand, ready to do something, ready ready to react. And sometimes your reaction is wrong, and you and you get it wrong. But actually, that's the joy of it. Mm. You know, it's not always perfect. It's not always, you know, you've got to work hard to, 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 get, to get it. I passionately believe this. If we, if we as photographers start sneaking around and, and behaving in a way that make other people feel edgy, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to get the, well, I'm not going to well, get the pictures yeah, that I want. I, I don't know what you think, Harriet, but particularly when, I wonder whether we've had this experience. I know I have recently in Oxford, where Oxford is one of those places where you meet a lot of street photographers. It's a, it's, it's a place, yeah, it's a beautiful city, and it's usually quite busy, so it's a good place to, to, uh, to go and do street photography, whatever street photography is, because I look at Giles, and he has sort of a bit of a non-believer with street. What, street photography? What, what's that then? <laughs> it's photography, photography, but let, let's call it what it is for the moment. I remember there was a chap coming down the, the road, I might, might have talked about this on the show before, and he was shooting from the hip. Now, shooting from the hip is something that many of our guests talk about, and I know that it's a done thing. Joel Meyeritz even shoots from the hip for some of his work. But I just felt when this guy was coming along, I, he wasn't even from the hip, he had, he had the camera held up uh, uh, chest level, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And I could see the finger was going click, 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 click. I thought, I'm going to be part of this. And there was a, there was a bit of a bugger in me at, at that particular moment. Uh, I, I think maybe, maybe as I... Maybe as I'm sort of edging more towards 60, maybe I'm becoming, as my kids will say, just a bit more grumpy, Dad. Um, as he came. Ca- <laughs> okay, <laughs> not quite there yet. Harriet, you're only 50, so stop it. Um, as, as he came towards me, I said, lift it to your eyes, son. <laughs> I probably deserve to be hit. But it was that moment I was thinking, just take a... F- Stop pretending you're making don't, a photograph. Don't you think it's an honesty thing as well? No, I do. If you've, yeah, if you've got the camera yeah. up to your eyes, yes. you are taking a photograph. Yes. If you've got it down here, you are being very sneaky, as you say. And, and it, it, to me, it's an honesty thing. I think it's a confidence thing as well. I was thinking, just have the confidence to make mm. a photograph. Or don't, yeah. as the case yeah. may be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then some people would say some of the best photographs are taken because you're absolutely unaware of it. I was entirely aware of it, to be honest. I mean, what can you say? Yeah, but maybe that's because I'm a photographer and I think, right, that's an unusual position to hold a camera yeah. if you're just carrying it around with you. You've never shot from the hip, have you? No, I don't. I don't I, I, you said it. It absolutely took the words out of my mouth. It's, I think it's dishonest. I really do because you know what 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 is it that you're trying to achieve? Actually, are you just you know you're just trying to be like um, what's his name the, the American magnum photographer, Gilden, uh, Bruce Gilden. He's yeah. just trying he's just trying to be like Bruce, Bruce Gilden. No, well Bru- and, Bruce and, Gilden makes and, no. And, and, no, he doesn't shoot from the hip. No, no, he'll, he'll be but, honest and in your face. But this idea of you know oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be all edgy and shoot like Bruce Gilden. Yeah. Well, don't shoot like Bruce Gilden because there's only one Bruce Gilden. Yeah. Shoot like insert your name here shoot like you yeah. but be honest about it be you know develop your own way of doing it and, and, and 
by engaging with the people, I think you're just, you're just into a whole different world of, of this idea that, that you, know, you, you can't engage. I, I, I hate it. Doesn't I, candid photography, though, doesn't that, isn't, isn't that... Maybe you'll get more candid photography by shooting from the hip, though. Absolutely not. Do you not think no, so? Just, just, no, absolutely right. And, and uh, I'm, I'm fully prepared to be sort of, you know, pulled apart on this, but this is, this is my understanding and, and, and how I've worked for 35 years in, in, in being a photographer, is if you're obviously doing something there, people will see you, understand that you're there, either leave the scene or, 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 or engage with you to tell you not to take the picture, or whatever. Yeah. But there will come a, a, a time where you become accepted in that, in that scene. And that's the time when you start making. Ca- and I've done lots of candid photographs. I've, a lot of a lot of what I shoot here on, on these, on on the fences, you know, these are, a lot of these are candid pictures. I haven't set anything up, but they know I'm there, and they know I'm not a threat, and they know I'm not I'm not trying to belittle them or put them down or take anything away or, I, I mean, more and more this is becoming a really important thing for me, of, of this thing of honesty of. But of engaging with humanity, you know, it's just like, otherwise, what are we doing it for? What's what's the purpose? To make some? It's, it's like it's like saying good morning to people as you're walking up into town, isn't it? Yes. People might look at you a bit oddly, but you know, we get a bit of a buzz out of it as well. But uh, but you make them smile. Yeah. This is like saying good morning with your camera. Absolutely. Isn't it weird having people in your garden? Very strange. <laughs> very, very strange. But also gives me the impetus to do all my gardening early in the year. Oh, does it? So now I can just look back and go and enjoy it. So Giles hasn't done all this? No, he cuts the grass. Oh, right. Yeah. Shattered your illusion. What's it like being married to a creative? <laughs> oh, shall I ask Sam that? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure she described me as that. I don't know. Uh, Giles is definitely toes. creative. He's a lovey. He's a lovey, but he's very. But it also keeps me on my toes because he's always thinking of new ideas. Yeah. But I also have to bring him down from some of his ideas. They get too wide. See, Sam says that to me. She'll say, "You know, you're an ideas merchant, but sometimes you need to see things through more." Yes, starter, be a starter finisher yeah. rather than just a starter. But that's. But you, you come from a corporate world where you understand that process. Yes, because we have to see things to yeah, fruition. Yeah. Whereas I think if you're being creative, you can explore and then maybe go to the left or to the right a bit more. He won't mind me saying this because he's talked about this on the programme before. And while he's over there talking to Harriet, we can talk about him. Talk about him. But this, the, the, the wonderful studio that he has has been so many things over the last couple of years. It's been a dark room, it's not been a dark room. Then it was a dark room again. It then it wasn't a dark room. Then I think there may have even been a third visit to a dark room. Be honest with me, does that drive you bonkers? <laughs> Sometimes, it depends if I'm paying for it. If I'm not paying for it, he can do what he wants. No, what, I, what we find is, if he's starting a new project, it's his way of clearing his head. Right. Redo, restart, clear up the office, blank piece of page, and then he's off. Yeah. So what I've noticed with Hometown Stories, that actually this has been consistent. You'll notice that that's been that same space for over a year, so which means actually he's in the right place for his projects. Oh. What do you think of the project? I love it. I absolutely love it. I think just having the open studios, we've brought so many different people in, you can see his mind sparking and then doing the courses that he's been doing, the the noise that's been coming out of that shed where I've been working and the fun and the way these guys are interacting, you can see it in their eyes. They're all loving it because they're all talking photographs without any boundaries. They are. He's he's got together a, a local group of, what, is it about a dozen people? I think it's Ish. about eight. About eight, eight, on a, eight yeah. people. So they go... Uh, I've been to a couple myself. They go for... Uh, there's a, a local cafe. I keep calling it Podium Opposers Palace, but it's not called it's that. Podium is it? Place, Podium isn't it? Place, mm. yeah. It's only because it has lots been. of... Have you not? Never. It's got all these sports cars in it. It's a very un like place. It is very... It's got all these lovely old, um, I, I think, Ferraris and Porsches. Quite and daunting to look it at. It is, yeah. 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 Well, when I draw up, if I bring Kia in... 
<laughs> I, I invariably think, well, I can't park there. It's next to a Maserati. They won't want my Kia here. But so it's quite a strange place for. But they have this amazing meet. They do good coffee. Um, he has this amazing meeting with all the, these people, and uh, it's become. I think it's like the camera club. I'd want to belong. It is, to. and that's what these guys were saying. Actually, that it's they can talk photography without any rules and regulations. They can make it as they want. And um, I think the whole point of the click and coffee, I think it's called, yeah, yeah. was to bring people together mainly yeah. men together but actually i think it's morphed into more of that actually it's men become together. Well, ma- i think it's because women will go off and do the women's institute and have lots of natural getting together this is all about bringing oh. different people together that may not realize that they could come together and have coffee was this a sort of mental health thing i think so via the the corn exchange i did not know that yes right yeah, yeah. i didn't realize that yeah that's what i understand it to be but i think that's what it's building more and more it's mainly a a male attending but i, th- I some that we've had one woman that was with Giles this time, and she was loving it. She was re- and she was yeah, yeah. really, really good. Has, has it changed the way you look at photography? All, all, all the years, I mean, you've been married to Giles for more than a life sentence now. Um, <laughs> has it changed the way that you look at photography and photographs, or are you are you any more engaged? Or I mean, you come from a very, very different world, Nick. Ever since I've known Giles, he's been doing photography. I think it probably has, but I'm so surrounded by it now. I think what I'm very fortunate about, I don't know if you've seen in his shed, you've seen the coronavirus diaries? Yes, and I have. I love yeah. the coronavirus coronavirus. And it's only now, I'm looking at it four years later, that I think how lucky I am that he was able to document that. And there's a piece oh, of God, history yeah. for the girls. Yeah. It's fabulous, because we never get that time back again. It's a huge book, isn't it? It's massive, absolutely. We were going through it today with someone, and just some little snippets, you forget what we did. Yeah. So I think I've, I'm just very fortunate he is documenting all the time the good, the bad and the ugly. Yeah, yeah. And I try and hide the ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't often get my wish. <laughs> and Giles Penfound returns shortly. Um, I did say we'd do the assignment. I've... Um, <laughs> I've either only just done it or I'm getting around to it, actually putting the assignment page up. Apologies, or the assignment post within the page of the assignments up. Apologies, but um, the two the two weeks away on retreat, they've been absolutely fantastic, uh, but there are, su- are some moments with a website that have been hard to, to keep in touch with. I might actually, I don't know, might actually extend the assignment into um, into another month or so. We can do that. Can we do that? Yes, Neil, no probs. You're part of the committee. Yeah, <laughs> you'll do. Uh, but the, uh, the assignment this month is still there for you to take part in. It's a one-word assignment. Let's, uh, let's talk to Gary Williams, who is setting this month's... The Photo Walk Assignment. A one-word assignment for the month of September. I'm intrigued to know what yours will be, Gary. The word... Is change. Oh, is there anything to do with your life since talking with you about how your life has sort of not completely changed, but it's gone from music to photography? Is it to do with you? Is it a personal story? Or it's because since I started becoming a professional photographer, I only have a small change in my pocket, and I used to have lots of. No, that's not the reason. The reason is it could be though. I know what it is. It definitely could be. Um, but the, the the reason is going back to Camden Passage is that's something that I observed over the four years of doing those photographs Ah. is how things change, you know, how people change. There are people that I photographed at the beginning of that project who are no longer with us. There are shops that have closed and new ones have come in. There's one particular fella who's actually photographed twice in that book. He's called Peter. He was in his 90s when I photographed. He's still in his 90s, but been there for many years. Since I started, he's now doesn't feel he's got the energy to have his little stall there once a week and still goes down there with his carrier bag once a week to buy his jellied eels from the fish shop in the street but you know he's getting older things are changing all the time and of course over a four-year period it was kind of easier to see and track that change but I think it might be really interesting and a great challenge to try and capture change in one photograph. Good luck then. Get your pictures in to the email address, which is stories at photowalk.show. Stories at photowalk.show.
www.thepixelshow.show on the show page. Oh, two and a half thousand pixels wide, please. But don't worry, if you can't, send them in. I will do the heavy lifting. Make sure you send in a link to your Instagram or your, your blog, your website, your Vero, whatever, so that I can make sure that you are, you are credited accordingly. Please don't uh, watermark them as well or put borders around them. And I'll think about having a little bit longer to, to take part in this, this particular one, which is a, which is a cracking one for this, uh, for this month, possibly into next. We've been doing a few specials, or I've been doing a, uh, hosting a few specials for you the last couple of weeks, and we have another one next week. Next week is the Scottish edition. You'll find out what we've been up to during the retreat. There will be some more dates to um, let you know about. Last year, the first week filled up, boom, straight away. It was gone. And uh, we opened up a second week. It's been a very... Well, we've worked on the, the retreat since we've been doing them. I've enjoyed every single one we've done. Though now I think they've come to a stage where we've really found um, our level with them. With um, creative writing being part of it, sound being part of it. We continue in the dark room. Uh, our walks we, that we make as well, it's, it's been, I think, um, two weeks of a great learning experience for me as well. There's been moments, particularly with creative writing, where I've thought, well, over to you. <laughs> I'm learning as much as those that are with me are learning. Having Merrin Glover as our professional writer, oh, absolute joy. So I will announce some dates on the show page next week. I've been making a few um, a few sketchbook pictures here. I'm working with, uh, well, it's, it's, I think I might use it for one of the exercises that we've been, we've, uh, I've been running, uh, that we've all been doing, uh, which is to make a soundscape about, um, well, made during a walk. And I had an idea, which was looking up into the trees and talking about the canopy and uh, looking up. But I like these pools of light. And I think, I think my soundscape, my sound story that I'm making as one of the exercises with everybody else, I think my one is going to be about pools of light. It's really, really had me thinking uh, about photography as much as those who've been with me. So I've got another pool of light here. This is um, this moss, spag is it sphagnum moss? Um, I better make this quickly actually because the light is going in we've been blessed with some beautiful sunlight and I want to get this 3.6 it is darker in the woods at the moment I've gone deeper into woodland that can't be 3200 ISO surely not oh it is f3.6 shutter speed 1 2 5th and uh, yeah another another pool a pool of light I th I think I've got something I want to write about that pool of, or the pools of light. Right, shall we return to Giles Penfound? My walks with my dear friend, uh, gathering some archive material here and talking with my special friend and my teacher, Giles Penfound. Your, your experience as an army photographer could be a whole episode in itself. He could talk about it for a long, long time. But I, 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 want, I want to talk about um, your life as a photographer. But in order to get to the next stage and when you left the army, it's probably, well, it's important to talk about your time spent in places like Iraq making photographs. So I went to the Imperial War Museum a couple of weeks back and we saw, well, you've got five pictures on permanent uh, display there now, haven't you? I saw the four. I probably saw the fifth, but didn't realise it was your one. But the, the four are together. What, what are those? So let's get through this gate. Those, um, those four pictures, the ones, that, um, the ones that I saw with the family, they are from Iraq, aren't they? Yeah, so there's a, there's a selection of four images um, Taken all, all taken within an area uh, um, south of Basra, just on the Shat al Basra waterway and a crossing called Bridge Four, um, and it's just kind of a major uh, sort of impact point, major conflict point during the um, during the the, the the Iraq War, and it's where I made a lot of images of, of kind of what was going on and what what we were doing there. But your job wasn't in um, uh, in surveillance, was it? Your your job by now had become you're in charge of. It seems a strange title, this, but uh, public hey, public relations within the army. Yeah, so I, I was 
so the, the, the official term was I was the chief uh, a P-info photographer so press information photographer right um, so basically I was, I was the chief press photographer and I was in charge of I can't remember now I think there was about 10 of us all associated with with, with being out there and I was, I was a warrant officer then um, and so I was responsible for all the photographers in theatre and all the equipment and directing the photographers yeah. but I was also there to make good PR pictures of what the army was doing that, that's in essence that was what my role was um, but I was very bad at it because I from the outset I, I knew and I'd, I'd known you know, since my time in, in Bosnia that, that I had a responsibility to to record it all as, or as much as a, of what was in front of me as I possibly could um, from as I suppose an unbiased point of view as possible um, uh, or an honest point of view as possible because some, some of the pictures I made were very very biased uh, very very biased against the army actually um, well, but, one of those pictures was uh, I think you got in a reasonable amount of trouble for the picture of uh, it, it was uh, it was an infantryman I think just uh, uh, doing some boot maintenance to, to his walking to his, his army boots yeah no there were this this is a um, so during, during the invasion phase and, and it's the, the Welsh guards were the infantry battalion and they were kind of resting up and this was at the stage where there's a big Ferrari about you know, the troops not having the right kit, and they didn't. And this guy's boots were literally falling apart. Um, and he, they were being taped up with sort of, uh, um, gaffer tape. And um, so I made this picture of his boot hanging off. And, and for me, it was about, again, it sounds fanciful, but for me it was about resilience and about the fact that he didn't give up just because his boot was falling apart. Um, but um, the they powers... They didn't see it that way, did they? No, oh, no. God, no, they went absolutely bananas. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and again, another and a beautiful example of, of the importance and, and the power of photography. You know, that's, that's, that's what it's about. Sometimes it's about... It is about upsetting people. You know, it's about um, just not bearing witness. You know, because when people say, no, everything's fine, they've got the equipment. You know, like, I'm not... I'm not going to say that I was the, the lone voice or anything as, as poetic as that. It's, that's nonsense. But I've got pictures to prove certain things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Now, whether people want to agree with that, that's up to them. But, but yeah. Uh, the bottom right-hand picture <laughs> in the Imperial War Museum. Now, we were at the Imperial War Museum for... Well, the, one of the main reasons was that our Jack, our eldest, for his history, is doing something on the, the Great War. And also, actually, the, the Holocaust because the Holocaust um, exhibition there, the, 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 it's ex extraordinarily well done. And um, there's a particular picture there, which is that bridge. You mentioned the bridge a moment ago, and we've talked about this bridge before. Uh, but it was, a, it was a very important picture that you made because it was of a British officer seemingly um, separating people. Well, no, it wasn't seeming, it actually was. It was, you know, the... Uh, well, again, you, the, you have to be honest and, and, and open about this, is, is the reason why they were separating people is because huge amounts of people were fleeing out of Basra and there was a, a fear that the Fedayeen fighters, who are the people we were fighting against, were infiltrating these people. And so there's a good, I suppose, militaristic reason for separating men and women to, to, to weed out possible Fedayeen fighters. Problem with that is, is that, you know, it sounds all good on paper, but when you see women and children being separated from their husbands, it's, it's, it's not good. It really isn't. And it's, um, you know... And it, it, it hadn't been long since you'd actually been making your own series of pictures at uh, Auschwitz, and that, that's where these two pictures and experiences collide well yeah and, I, and i've said in, in that, that film you, you we made, we made together you know there, there are moments when you make pictures as a photographer that that it's sometimes you can't you can't separate you no. know um, that they they all kind of kind of work work towards each other and I'm, i made an image at, at the selection ramp at Auschwitz, birkenau and imagining then then as a soldier how i would have behaved and quite clearly you know i would never be involved in that then all of a sudden you know Years, a number of years later, there I was in the middle of Basra, um, on the outskirts of Basra. You know, part of a fort attacking a sovereign country illegally, ca 
carrying out an illegal action um, for for just morally repugnant reasons. And you know, yeah, we weren't the SS. We weren't, you know. Uh, well, yeah, it's all about degree, isn't it? But we were wrong, you know. And, and and what we were doing there was wrong, and we were we were brutalising these people. And you know, and there. And what did I do? I did nothing. You know, I did absolutely nothing. You made pictures. Yeah, and it, it's a mute point. It was, it's it's something that, that that kind of haunts. It does haunt me. It really does. Um, because you know, okay, I'm, I was able to make the pictures, and it's a. Is it Pyrrhic victory? Is that the one? Is that right? Um, but it, it's um, yeah. I, I suppose the the issue that I have, and I will always have, about not saying something about what happened there to the people who are doing what they were doing, is um, I suppose tempered uh, sort of by the fact that I've, I've got I've got the pictures and I, and I tell the story. So you know, but it's it is what it is, isn't it? Giles went sort of running off to one side <laughs> to make pictures of. Uh, this is this is this is a scene that you've taken many times. Oh no! Every, every time I come up here, I see it differently. Yeah, I just, I just adore it. Absolutely. Well, don't adore let me it. stop you. What are you photographing this, in particular? There's line of trees and this uh, this fence, this barbed wire fence in front. There's something very very. I don't know. <laughs> it's just wonderful. It's uh, let me get this. That's, uh, Let's go all, go all green, Jack. Yeah. And then, I'm not lying on the floor with you. Oh, it's, just, it's worth it. It is so worth it. It's, uh, oh, it's just lovely. It's, it's the thing I love about what's part and what's not part of the landscape. And so many people will see a landscape and say, well, don't take any pictures of that um, lovely barbed wire fence. Yeah, yeah. But get down in the right position and uh, I don't usually look at my pictures. Oh, get in there. Oh, look at that. The silhouettes all come together. The trees are part yeah. of the barbed wire. You see this? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you see? Isn't that sky <laughs> gorgeous? That sky as well, though, isn't it? You, you, saw a, you saw a face in the sky just a moment ago. I yes. thought, what have you put in the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> look at any more of that. <laughs> What year did you uh, did you leave the army? 2007. Uh, it's more recent than I think. Really? Did you think it was longer, yeah, longer ago? Yeah. yeah. 17, good Lord, 17 years this year. Is it? That's amazing. Here yeah, in wow. June... Yeah, the official date was the 11th of November. But because of my terminal leave and all this, I, I left in... Um, where was it? June, I think it is. I did. Uh, I did a Lord Lucan and, and, <laughs> and just dis and you disappeared. disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I know you went off for a, a little while. You photographed, I think, in New York and did a few different things. Do you uh, when when you when you left the army? Did, did you did you miss the army or did you miss the the photography as part of the army? Yeah, I know you were you were very well, still are very well respected as a as a former army photographer. Uh, I, I, I didn't miss it immediately because I was happy to get out and, uh, and go and do commercial work, mm. and, and which I did, and I, and I, I set up a business and it ran very well. It was only in latter years um, that, I, that I missed it, and, and I suppose... Hang on, so when I first knew you, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. that was 2004, so you were still in the army? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. So, yeah, in fact, no, it was... We met in two thousand and five, right? Because I was I was at um, I was at Middle Wallet then, so it was the right ah. right at the end, right, right at the end, right of, my at the end of it. Yeah. yeah. So I, what I missed, and and it's not the army per se that I missed, and but I I, I missed the the notion of being part of something, being part of an organisation, being yeah. part of something that's bigger than you, being having a purpose, all those kind of wonderful things. I, I missed the discipline. I missed the if I if I be really honest, I missed being told what to do. You know, I, I, I work best when people say, go and do that. I don't necessarily do it in, in a prescribed way, but, yeah. but having... Yeah. And, and I, I did miss that. I, I don't anymore. I, I, I think now, yeah, in, in the last year, um, since coming back from Australia, working with a, my, one of my dearest friends, uh, Gaz... Uh, um, oh, he's so dear, I can't remember. 
No. <laughs> I must say it's very cold. <laughs> and we've been having this problem walking along the along the path. Ramo. <laughs> Gary Ramo. Yeah. See, I'll remember it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Gary, as your deepest friend. <laughs> it's been two months, the bloke, and I can't remember his name. Anyway, uh, so I spent some time working, helping him with a project. Yeah. And came back. Not on, not immediately, but but then to sort of start to realise what it is that I want to do. What, what is you know where am I at the moment? What is my meaning? What is my purpose? Um, you know, look, take the family and, and and my absolute devotion for my family. Take that out of the equation if if, if that's possible. It's it's you, I, I don't know if people will resonate. This will this will resonate with people. You get to the point. You kind of go, why am I doing what I'm doing? What is it that I'm doing? And I did come to a point where I kind of go, well, what am I doing? You know, why am I doing this? And um, I, I know now, I absolutely know with a, with a clarity that I haven't known for a very long, long time. Um, and it's, it's just joyous. It's absolutely joyous. Because you flirted with wedding photography for a while. I mean, you worked with me actually on a few, few or I worked with you on a few weddings. Um, that didn't work out. It wasn't something that you... You necessarily, or may, maybe I've never been able to tunnel as well as you have. <laughs> um, I don't mean that. I've, I mean, I've had some terrific times doing it myself. We have a very different, uh, a, a different view of weddings. It didn't work for you, though, did it? Well, the, the reality is, is that commercially, it's the best photography I've ever oh, done, with, without, without, without a doubt. And it was great. It really was. Because, look, I, I did about 150 weddings, I reckon, I, I would imagine, being honest, probably two or three at a stretch, four had problems as, associated with them. The vast majority of people were just lovely yeah, and really yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. And it was great and made some lovely pictures. But I got to the end of it. I got, well, I got to the point where I remember walking to a, sort of one of the last weddings I did into, into the bride's room. And I just thought, I, I did this exactly. I did this. Yeah. This is the exact thing I did last week. Yeah. I, I'm going to take the exact pictures I took last week. And what what bugged me was that I wasn't being true to my clients. I wasn't being, I wasn't giving them my best because my heart wasn't in it. Isn't it funny? Because I see it in such a different way that you are going to the same event, but it's never the same. Yeah, I, it isn't. Yeah, mm. and you're absolutely right. It isn't because the people are different, and yeah. and the and the location is different, and and the, there are differences. But I don't. I think I'd perhaps I'd exhausted my, the. Yeah. The, the limits of my imagination with wedding photography. So it's, it's not wedding photography that's at fault. It's me that's at fault because I wasn't able to... Um, and also, I'm I'm hopeless businessman. I, you know, I'm to business what Genghis Khan was to world <laughs> wind diplomacy. Or as, or, as, or, as, or as Blackout would say, there's bits of lemon peel floating down the Thames that will make a better businessman than me. So, yeah. you know, which is, which is why I don't do it anymore. I, I, I've never thought of myself as a great business person. My friend Kevin, well, you know Kevin, yes. and he's, um, yeah, I think he's next week's episode. Well, I hope. I'm yet to record that, so <laughs> it might be different. But he's a great business person. You know, he's a good, solid, strong photographer, great eye, good ideas, strong ideas. But you marry it um, with his business uh, acumen as well. It works really well for him. And I, we've often joked, haven't we? Like we're we're, we're two artisans sat out on a French street, wondering when the, when the next uh, Frank is going to come along. Wouldn't have been a euro then, of course. <laughs> no, I, I, it's it's interesting with with Kevin. I'm, I I admire him. I admire his his business acumen and his ability because yeah. it is extraordinary. And I, I admire people. I admire you. I admire what you do, and and your. Um, I don't know, a what you do with this program, but but you, the business that you do, I just I I think that's a, a massive failing with me is 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 that it gets in the way for me. Money gets in the way for me. Yeah. It really does, and it's it's <laughs> which is. Do you think it's the old artisan argument of you you can't have money and art at the same time? I mean, that's a whole program all of its own. Well, no, I think I'm just too, stu too stupid. No, no, but I mean, it wouldn't just be, you know, a lot of people talk about photography, well, art and, and money as, as being not great bed partners. 
then it's all I can say is it's not for me. No. Okay. And and I I see photography for me has always been always been about the the, the purity of making the image. Yeah. Actually, not a, not only about making the image. It's about the the subject. It's about discovering more about the subject. Yeah. Where it's where the whether it's people or a landscape predominantly it's about people about understanding what they're doing and how life affects them and and I just I, I came to the realisation as well, why am I associating money with this and look it has to be said I'm in an extraordinarily fortunate position of um, you know, Nicola my wife Nicola is just the most extraordinary person yeah. in my life she, it's, it's not a she's generously agreed for me to in effect retire okay so I don't I don't have to do I don't have to associate what I do with money okay so I can absolutely because she knows she knows I'm absolutely hopeless with it which is why you know if, if it was up to me we'd all be living in Charing Cross Arches well I've spoken with her I'm moving in next week well, that's, that's <laughs> we're moving you into the shed I'm, I'm, off, I'm off out um, and so along with that comes a responsibility along with that privilege and yeah. it is a privilege comes a responsibility to do okay what am I going to do with that and and there's that real oh man alive there's a joy attached yeah. to that there really is of, of taking this thing that we do that I do this this joy um, and just running with it and, and doing it for the absolute sheer pleasure of making images of engaging with people of just seeing it where it goes I, I love it uh, and that thing is um, is hometown stories which we're going to talk about now I didn't know we'd actually known each other since 2005 we're coming up for our 20th anniversary oh. <laughs> shall we do something special <laughs> what's 20th people will I can't remember I can't remember what, what's the 20th wedding anniversary Leica. is it a Leica yeah, we'll, we is it a Leica get, we both get a Leica yeah yeah yeah, yeah that sounds about a pro- that sounds appropriate Appropriate. Look at these. Look at the sunshine with these trees here. Isn't it? Look at the shapes of these. That's amazing, isn't it? I think Mully would love it down here. He we, would. We, we've got he to bring would. him down here. We really do. He'd be all unnecessary at this point. <laughs> is that what he, is that what he gets? <laughs> He'd go running off. <laughs> oh, f- me. He'd say, look at that. In a sort of Peter K. light way. Look at that. He'd be gone. <laughs> you wouldn't see him until it got dark. I've got, I've got my tree again. Oh, so got oh, this is the tree. This is this is the tree. There's the tree. You see, through the barbed oh, wire. It could be poetic, but it's not. That's fantastic. That really is. It's just that that simplicity. I adore it. There we go. Marvelous. There we go. We're going to. Uh, to make a big geographic leap. Having talked about your life now becoming this, well, mission almost of, 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 of recording your, um, your locality, where you are, where you live geographically, there's another part of the world that you absolutely adore and you photograph there and you made some extraordinary stories. It's quite a few years ago now when you first visited uh, uh, India to photograph and you're itching to go back. Yeah, it's, in fact, it's exactly 10 years ago this year... Is it? ...that I was last there. And wow, it was... Okay. Um, there's something about India... Again, I, I can't describe... I wish I, wish I was more poetic I could stri- describe it better, but it's, it's one of those places that just got into my heart and soul. Yeah. It, it is just truly one of the most magnificent countries I've ever visited, bar none, uh, absolutely bar none. Um, everything about it was, was... It's a... People have talked about it, but... It, being an assault on the senses, and it, and it truly is. Ah, but but I just adored it, absolutely adored it. Then I was there 10 years ago with my f- very good friend of mine, Gaz Tyson, who was, I was uh, working on a course with him. Oh, yeah. And I uh, spent a week with him there, and then I stayed f- for a week uh, and just made some stories and just engaged. Um, and so I was... <coughs> obviously fully committed to hometown stories absolutely that this is what i'm going to be doing but there was, a, there was like this this calling you know and this something was missing and i i don't make um new year's uh, resolutions but over christmas i was thinking well, what is it why am i you know what's missing and then i realized it's india india is missing 
that's that's what I that's what I need to get back to. I think you feel the same way as I feel about the Gambia. Funnily enough, yeah. I, 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 if if it's what I feel about India, I can yeah, yeah, yeah. completely understand. I really do. Yeah. I, I um, you know, the the everything about it. You know, there's <laughs> there's everything you can ever want there. Well, certainly for me. And and but the difference is is so that my work there and my stories there. Is, this is where the whole idea of documentary falls apart. I'm not going there as a documentary photographer. No. I'm not. I'm going there absolutely as a tourist. I'm going there as a wide-eyed, impassioned, inquisitive tourist who just wants to engage and find out more. So, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping to go back this year. Um, oh, soon. Yeah, no, I want, and so hope in the second half of the year, that's so I'm hoping to go back and to get some, get some more work there. But also, so I have this... Again, the romance of photography. I have this idea of spending the rest of my life going back to India. Do you? And, yeah, ab- yeah, absolutely. And exploring. So my two projects I want to do is hometown stories, and in, it's, I'm India. calling it India Odyssey because in many ways that's that's what it is for me. Um, I, I'm again. I'm not. I'm not going there to tell them what they should do with their country, how they should behave. Um, I, I, I'm not interested in any of that. I'm not interested in in writing wrongs or or whatever. Um, but I'm I'm interested in the people, and I'm interested in it's just this <laughs> extraordinary place and these extraordinary people. You made some um, the, the, the ten years ago when you made those pictures first time. Or well, one thing you did is something that I'm extremely jealous about, which I've always wanted to do, and probably because my dad watch the great train journeys and uh, that would be a son and dad moment that program um so you made one one of the well you made a great train journey i mean there's a lot more of <laughs> of their rail network to uh to 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 explore where where did you go you went from was it mumbai no, to... this is from from uh, uh, um new delhi to Jodhpur, oh, and, and so right. and, yeah. and and this, in fact, it's interesting. We should, you should mention that program because this is where this fascination with India started with me. Wow. Was from a program called the Great Great Way, Railway Journeys of the World, and um, and I can remember seeing a program. Um, it was this chap did a uh, a trip to uh, Deccan, the Deccan province where the Deccan traps are, and um, and I remember seeing that in. I recently found out it was 1980, so I was I was 15, and just being awed by this place. Yeah, absolutely amazing, and and by the people, and about trying to get there. And I did, I managed it 10 years ago, and it's sort of been a an unfulfilled desire since then. To I've always said I've got to go back, I've got to go back, but I've just never had a chance. But now I'm going to no. make I'm going to make that chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so when you're there, will you be doing more portraits? I know you've said you're going with a. You're not going with a, a, a any, any real purpose uh, apart from having your tourist eyes, as you said. But you did make some striking portraits when you were there. Yeah, and, and I'll, I will I'll be open to everything, to be honest with you. Everything within the range of what I do. Um, I The big mistake, the massive mistake I made last time was that I, I took out a 5 by 4 film camera and um, I just wasted inordinate of time trying to make pictures on this this film camera when I should have just doing did, been doing what I do best was use, using my Leicas mm. so absolutely I just go out there with my three Leicas 21 uh, 50 and a 35mm lovely lovely very simple absolutely strip strip back and I have I have no plan at all other than to get there so when when I get there then I'll start making pictures of how I react to it lovely and so you know the um, when I even know, and now I've, I've even planned it, that you know there'll be a series of books, which will be called uh, India Odyssey, and they'll just be volumes of pictures. It's that, an empty volume at the moment yeah, because you don't know what's going to be no. in it till you arrive, yeah. and that is the most amazing thing about what we do, isn't it? Yeah. When we open our, uh, what does Marissa Roth say? Open your heart and mind, I think she says, yes, think so. um, to 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 what will fall before you without going with too much of a plan. And, and again, the, the wonderfully poetic thing for me is, and forgive me, this may sound a bit fanciful, but this is, this is closing a circle for me. 
because the, the person who really inspired me above everybody else was Cartier Bresson. Yeah. And so I'm inspired by the work he did in India. Um, and it's not, I'm, I don't want to go back there to copy what he did. I want to go there to do what I want to do. But it's like, I don't know, it's, it feels like I'm, I'm coming, I'm completing that circle. Like, okay? and that circle is two things, hometown stories and India Odyssey. But it's, it's of engaging with people of, and this is what I found the last time. I was the only Western white guy there, okay, for most of the time. It's this wonderful thing about human beings. We can actually communicate with each other even when we can't speak each other's language. And I've, I had these amazing moments of speaking with railway workers or yeah. whomever, you know, yeah. I, I didn't really care. Um, I mean, one, one day I was at um, a place called the Miranda Forts, which is just this beautiful, beautiful place. And this young chap on a bike came up to me and said, do you need a lift? And so I didn't do that usual British thing of being, oh, you know, couldn't possibly talk to a local. And yeah, that's very kind of you. So I jumped on the back of his bike, he took me into town <laughs> and uh, didn't want any payment for it. You know, and we had a good chat and I made some nice pictures. And it's, I think that's, that's the thing. It's about engaging with human beings, which is, you know, and the, bo- and the bonus is you get some lovely pictures as well. Uh, this is your Cartier Bressel moment. It is. I shall channel. I shall channel the dear chap. <laughs> Obviously, not creating any pictures in anywhere near the worth of, that he would. But, uh, that, but no, that's, what, that's not what it's about. It's just about. Well, it's about doing what I know I want to do, and that I can't explain to you what I want to do. That might be the end. By the way, it might, the music may have tailed off. Okay. So if you're hearing this bit, this will be a bit like the other day when I went to see Peter Kay, the comedian who uh, I would imagine is more well-known in, in the UK than other parts of the world. But he said, um, there's, there's four parts to this show. He said, uh, there's part one, which is roughly what I'm doing. There's part two, which is roughly what I'm doing. And there's part three, which is what I'm doing. <laughs> And he said, there's part four, pudding, (laughs) which is a lovely English phrase, isn't it, pudding? (laughs) Pudding. Now, he says, a little bit of advice for you. Don't leave before pudding. (laughs) And he went through and there 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 seemed to be a natural end to the show. And all these 20,000 people at the O2 Arena, that's a lot of people watching a comedy show, isn't it? And uh, he's the only comedian that's done a, a residence for a month at the O2 Arena. He pulls a fair amount of people in anyway, said, don't, don't leave. Inevitably, people thought that the end of the show had happened. They were all leaving. And then up on the screen came, uh, should we do a sing song? <laughs> and everybody was like, oh, hang on. <laughs> should we go back to our seats? And you could see this sort of people thinking, oh, no, we're, we're walking now. We can't stop. Keep walking. And he said, are you ready for pudding? <laughs> Now, I don't want to say what happened to the rest because he did ask us all not to film or talk about it. So I'm going to stay faithful to that. So this might be my pudding moment with you. Um, I've never asked you what your why is. Because I have to. I just, I just have to. I, I um, it, it is, it is the thing that keeps me going other than my family so take take my wife and my daughters out of this okay and and my close closest friends this is the thing that keeps me alive this is the thing that that the reason for me It, it is it is it is it is everything for me and my thanks to giles penfound for being my guest on this archive special this particular week. I'll leave some links to uh, to Giles and uh, we'll pop some pictures on the the show page as well. Now, I would like to hear from you about your greatest teacher, Stroke Teachers, your mentor, your support pillar, those that have believed in you. They won't necessarily be a parent, as I said right at the head of today's show. These uh, people often come from the, the least expected places. Please write to me, stories at photowalk.show, stories at photowalk.show. I know a, a lot of letters that come into the show have accompanying pictures, and it's always a joy. We've got some to read uh, over the, the coming months, autumn into to winter, some 
actually quite, um, well, no, very potent, powerful stories, which I know you'll take inspiration from. And thank you to those of you, I suspect you probably know I'm talking to you, who've been writing those in. But they don't have to come in with, uh, with pictures, your stories and your thoughts. And this one probably oh, may not necessarily be one of those. So your greatest teacher, your mentor, your support pillar, I'd love to hear from you and why um, they've encouraged you, particularly in your creative endeavours like photography. Stories at photowalk.show. And that's it for today. Now, if you can't wait until next Friday and you'd like to walk a little further together, then the Extra Mile edition number 106 is waiting for you. A very special guest on that show today. We've, I, well, we've, we've done poetry on the show. That's what poetry along the path is about. But we've not done poetry on the show. And the Extra Mile... There is a very, very um, special guest that I have who is going to read poetry, talk about poetry, and probably uh, explain the thoughts behind writing as well to, a, to an extent. And, uh, well, I've teased you enough. She'll be on the extra mile today. Kate McCullough, I know you'll enjoy... It's not a conversation, actually, with Kate. Kate really takes to the floor, and it's Kate's show definitely. Our PS to the show is to come, but before that, we need a playout song, just to make some final frames to. I'll think about what's been said today, and um, once again, I'm turning to my archive of music for something. This is Andrew Word with a wonderful song called Fields. In the smoky light And in the rain Working through and through the haze You lay it down each day With heavy eyes Just to wake again Just as tired So Light enough to shine upon the fallow fields I can see
song called fields this is uh I, i've walked through the forest and i've it looks like a mausoleum of sorts it's a, a rat oh look at that spider <gasps> look just there oh neil don't like those I'm, i don't know is he one of those false widows or oh, don't touch it neil no i won't he's uh he's about a foot up from the uh the ironwork that's the gate to this mausoleum I can't, um, I can't go in because it's locked. How strange, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, let me get a photograph. Hold on, reverse, reverse. I've got my, I've taken my X100V away with me this week. I have had um, my Fujifilm X-H2S with me. I haven't really used it. I had a film camera at the start of the week as well. But I've lent on my X100V, which I love for travelling. Absolutely adore it. Let me get a picture. ISO 800, f3.6, shutter speed, 1 1 2 5th, and it is a sketchbook image. It's probably a sort of research sketchbook image because I want to read about this and find out what it is. I'll leave a link on the show page if I find out. There might be a sign up here. Is this a sign? Hold on. Oh, it's a bit slippery. What's this? Uh, no. What is that? It's just a stick. E19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14. What do those E numbers mean? Is that some sort of... No. Is that some kind of level? Just because there's a lot of stonework here. Just to check the thing's not falling down. Maybe it's some kind of measure for when there's snow in the forest. I don't know, a bit confused about that. Just a, a few...
closing thoughts before the PS, please would you write to me about your mentors and your teachers. Stories at photowalk.show. Stories at photowalk.show is the email address. I uh, suspect there won't be pictures that necessarily come with this, and uh, I, I, I do keep... Well, here, here's my opportunity. I keep saying to myself, remind those that wish to write in, and uh, my other listener, of course, that you don't have to write long essays. Sometimes letters, I know, are, are more pithy, and you might just have a short story that you want to share. I'd be delighted, absolutely delighted to hear from you. So send those... Um, those thoughts about teachers, mentors to stories at photowalk.show my, uh, my sincere thanks to you if you are or you're about to become an extra miler I promise you what a show this week um, with Kate McCullough we'll keep building this wonderful community of kindness in the photographic and walking world together a safe place to share our thoughts about this thing that we do photographing and walking. My thanks to Neil Ford, who looks after IT so diligently. Andrea Gilpin, who's across Instagram. I haven't done much on Instagram the last week and a bit. Been a tad busy with people, but I shall share some wonderful pictures that have been made during the Photo Walk Retreat Weeks. And Kelly Mitchell, who was on week one, actually, uh, and who looks after our Facebook members. A postscript for the show then. And it has to be one about teachers. And I found this one, which in itself is, is pithy. Uh, but I think it speaks perfectly of my dad, my radio friend, Robbie, and my dear friend and teacher, Giles Penfound, in terms of photography. I guess in many ways, uh, Giles the, is, is the, the reason. I'm going to have to practice a little self-deprecating output now. The reason that this idiot, i.e. me, is even here making this podcast each week it's, uh, in many respects, down to you as well, Giles, you know. And that's why I think Dad, with his belief in me being a radio presenter, despite the fact my first tapes sound like Mickey Mouse sucking helium from a party balloon, and, uh, and you, Giles, have some kind of, well, I, I, was, I suppose it, I could describe it as an invisible crossover. It's a crossover anyway, because of, of the sounds, then becoming photography, then becoming sound again. So uh, here's a PS to all teachers and mentors, and in particular to mine. And it comes from Colleen Wilcox. And it's this. Teaching is the greatest act of optimism. The Photo Walk is a Loading Zone production.